Hello and happy Valentine's Day, happy President's Day, and happy African American History Month. Those last two are especially American holidays, uh, and today we're going to discuss that last one, Black History Month. We'll talk about the important roles that African Americans played in World War I. I know that's a pretty specific topic, but it's also a really interesting one, especially for history buffs out there. So you're watching Let's Chat, which is a weekly program on American culture hosted by the American Cultural Center Algiers. I'm Emily Walker. Uh, the American Cultural Center Algiers, or ACCA, has not yet reopened. I know a lot of people have been asking that. Uh, we'll let you know when we feel it's safe enough to reopen given the COVID-19 situation. Uh, so we'll just let you know as soon as we are reopen. But in the meantime, we're offering these virtual programs uh, like this one that you're about to hear. And also there's four other American spaces. There's one in Constantine, Iran, Morgala, and Bashar. Those are open. So if you live near those cities, I encourage you to seek out those spaces and pay them a safe, preferably face mask visit. They do a lot of cool activities there and they're really fun centers to hear talks like this and to practice your English. So now to our guest. I'd like to introduce you to Rebecca Robinson. She's the assistant to the executive office at the US Embassy Algiers. She's been with the U.S. Diplomatic Corps for 18 years. She served at posts such as Dubai, Islamabad, Jerusalem, Geneva, and Paris. Um, she has served and lived in the Middle East region, uh, exploring as much as allowed as in each country. One of her favorite things to do when she's living abroad is to shop in the souks, and her home is filled with treasures from around the world. She's from the Sooner State, and if you wanna look up where that is in the United States, you get some bonus points. You can type it in the YouTube comments. Um, and she really looks forward to being with you this evening. We're so excited to have her to share a topic that she's especially interested in. But before we get to her presentation, her history presentation, Rebecca, I'd love to ask you, you've lived all over the world. Um, what are some things you like about living in Algeria? There's a lot, Emily, thank you. Uh, for one, Today is a perfect example. I love the weather in Algeria. I consider winter is the perfect time of the year. It doesn't get too cold and it doesn't get too hot. So I love being here with that. I love the majestic views of the Mediterranean Sea. There's not too many places in the world where I could live and have views of the Mediterranean Sea. And it's beautiful. And I love the changing of the seasons when the birds fly south and the birds fly north. Sometimes I have that occasional view of the mountains surrounding the city and you have a beautiful country for what I've been able to see pre-COVID. It's beautiful from the Sahara to the mountains to the sea. So that sums up a big part of what I love about your country. And I'll share a few more tidbits as we go along this evening. So thank you. Great, thanks. I agree with all that. This weather right now is fabulous. I was outside today and the bees are buzzing and pollinating the flowers on the rosemary bushes. It's delightful. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us. And now on to a presentation you've prepared about the importance of African-Americans in World War I. Uh, you can start sharing your screen and kick off with that. Uh, and for viewers on YouTube, if you'd like to ask Rebecca any questions about this topic, please write those questions in the YouTube chat and we'll ask her. Uh, you're also free to ask Rebecca questions about herself, her travels, her impressions of Algeria and things of that nature. So without further ado, Rebecca. Okay, Emily, thank you for that lovely introduction. And thank you to each of you for sharing some of your time this evening to be with me and to hear a part of history that I discovered that I didn't even know about my own country and I found it fascinating. So this evening we're gonna go through, bear with me, I'm gonna do a little bit of history of World War I because it leads us up to the introduction of the Harlem Hellfighters which is mostly what I wanna share with you this evening. So with that, we're going to go ahead and get started. And I'm gonna start with a little bit of history of World War I. So sit patiently for the good part. World War I, the war to end all wars. This war initially broke out because the Archduke of the Austro-Hungarian Empire was assassinated by Bosnian Serb. That doesn't go over too well. So the Austro-Hungarian Empire issued an ultimatum to the Serbians and the Serbians failed to respond. Well, that ultimately started in war. 
And so with that, I'm gonna move on here. The allies at that time to the Austro-Hungarian Empire was Germany, big powerful force in Europe in the early 1900s. So they sided and then Russia decided to side with France. And as war goes, it broke out all over Europe. Everybody was involved somehow. But you can see from the colors that the green represented the allies going forward. I don't wanna bore you with a lot of statistics, but as you can see by the map, and as you all know, the United States is nowhere near Europe. There's a big body of water called the Atlantic Ocean that's separating them for, from being together. So this war started, I had it on that first screen, started in 1914. That's when the assassination took place. War was raging, war was going on at that time. In the United States, being in a European war. Okay, so why? Well, in the spring of 1917, the United States actually declared war on Germany. Why? Well, let me tell you. The United States was supplying a lot of material to the war effort. So they were sailing across the Atlantic Ocean at that time. Well, the Germans had submarines and boats and they were shooting and destroying a lot of our ships that were sailing. They even shot and uh, torpedoed an American passenger ship, ship, excuse me, with innocent Americans on board. In addition, the Germans- Rebecca, were I'm really sorry to uh, interject so soon, but I have to tell you that famous passenger ship that was torpedoed by a German U-boat, my great grandmother was on board that ship. No, yes. yes, she was Scottish and she was visiting her brother in Indiana in the United States. This is in the year 1910. Uh, and she was sailing back to Scotland when it was torpedoed. And she was one of the several thousand survivors. Many, many people died uh -huh. on that. She was pulled into uh -huh. a life. Boat. She lived uh -huh. and I, because of that. So well, my family has a personal connection to that piece of World War I history. <laughs> Emily, that's amazing. Okay, that's the end of my program. I can't top that. That's something fascinating. So remember- I'll do a presentation on her story sometime. She's a fascinating person, but back to you. Be. That would be, thanks, Emily. So anyway, they were, as you can see, they were shooting the submarines at our ships, all of this merchandise going across. But in addition, the Germans, Mexico, south of the United States, United States, Mexico's down here. The Germans were inciting the Mexicans to declare war on the United States. Why, we really don't know. Well, that was enough. So America declared war on Germany and entered into World War I in the spring of 1917. More than 2 million United States soldiers fought on the battlefields of France. As you know, war is ugly. It is not something to be taken lightly by governments to enter into war. World War I was to be known as the war to end all wars. There were more than 70 million people mobilized. This included men and women because women went as nurses, mobilized throughout Europe fighting this war. You can still see the map and how big that was. 60 million Europeans. It was one of the largest wars and sadly it was one of the deadliest wars with more than 7 million people dying. And interestingly enough, 1918, as we are in the era of COVID right now, worldwide pandemic, a worldwide pandemic came out in 1918, resulting in another 50 million deaths. So you've got war in Europe and you've got this nasty pandemic and everybody's dying. It's all ugly, 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 ugly. So America has entered the war. We're coming into it. And this is also something I want you to remember. World War I was known for what was called trench. It's T-R-E-N-C-H, trench warfare. You can see from this photo on the screen, it's dug out. It's digging down deep into the ground and making these passageways. Both allies had this. Both sides were fighting and digging these trenches all over. And as you can maybe have seen old movies where the soldiers run and jump into the trenches and they're fighting during war. They weren't elaborate, it's dirt. It was dirt and mud. And when it rained, it was really mud. 
but they tried to camouflage them. They tried to keep them safe. You can see how they tried to board up a little bit to make this a spot, but this is where war was fought from these trenches, barbed wire around the top. The land in between the trenches of the two allies, and there's all this land in the middle, this was called no man's land, no man's land. I want you to remember that, no man's land. So you can see, here's just a color photo. They make it look very cozy and comfortable down there. You know it had to be dirty, it's dirt. Rain, muddy, bad weather, cold weather, snow. They're all down in there. It was such a vast network of tunnels, of offices for the officers and everybody going down there. But as men are often tall, it had to be dug deep enough to accommodate all these men standing there. So this photo to kind of shows a good photo, gives you an idea of what it was. So think about that, digging these trenches all over to fight these major battles in Europe. And remember, no man's land. Okay, significant for World War I, but never used again really in war after with the introduction of armored tanks and everything else for future wars, they never dug these trenches again. But you can still go to parts of northeastern France and see where this was in the battlefields with the trenches. It's hard to imagine, a lot of work. Okay, does this slide look familiar to you by chance? Did you know that Algeria represented one of the largest supplier, suppliers of material resources and manpower to the war effort outside of the European continent? Bet you didn't know that, but I bet your grandparents do. With this, another part of what I love about your country is the produce, the fresh produce that I get. I shop at Premier May and I love the seasonal produce. Doesn't have pesticides, it's good, it's clean and mm, scrumptious. I love that about your country. Well, Algeria fed the troops and fed the citizens of France. A lot of what was done, your country contributed greatly to the efforts of World War I, greatly. So you can imagine it's dirty, it's dingy, there's no boys farming because they're all fighting the war. And from Algeria comes the produce and food and the sensation of potatoes and seasonal things, it's fantastic. In addition, your country, Al Algerians took to the battlefields. So they were fighting also with the Americans and the French. They were allied with the Americans and the French during that time. And the Algerian infantrymen were among the most praised and decorated during the war. So I think that's a little fascinating fact of your country and you all should be very proud of it. I found it fascinating when I discovered this. So anyway, I had to share that with you, had to toss that in when we're doing a little bit history of World War I. Okay, you still with me? Stick with me. We're getting to the good part. War, we need soldiers, we need men. This is Uncle Sam saying, I want you for the US Army, find your nearest recruiting station. As I said earlier, the United States was supplying raw materials during the war prior to getting involved in it, money, food, whatever they could. Once the United States declared war on Germany, US troops began arriving in Europe at the rate of 10,000 a day. That's a lot of boys going over to Europe to fight a war. The US war effort grew significantly, but also keep in mind, we had that pandemic going on. So people were dying and we needed, we needed soldiers, we needed men and the United States was recruiting. Now, little fact I'm gonna share with you. Before the United States entered World War I, the governor of the state of New York, everybody knows where New York is because you think of New York City. So the governor of New York was a wise man. He realized that the war effort was gonna need more young men. Again, he recognized this pandemic was going on and they needed young men. So he started a unit of what we call the National Guard in the United States, a unit out of Harlem, which is a celebrated black community in New York City. Now, Black History Month, black men, I'm gonna be honest with you. 
Black men were contributing to the war effort, but they were laborers. Remember those trenches I showed you on previous slides? Black men were digging them. They were sent over, but they were taking off things off the ships and unloading and digging trenches throughout. They were working 24 hours a day. So the black men were there fighting, but they weren't necessarily enlisted as military men. These laborers, these black laborers, they worked hard, sometimes 24 hours a day, trying to get everything out and getting going. As the efforts to recruit men was growing, the New York governor that had created this National Guard unit from Harlem, he knew they needed to be a part of it. And he created the Harlem Hellfighters, as they were known. The Harlem Hellfighters were the most celebrated African-American regiment in World War I. And yes, they confronted racism as they went in for World War I. In order to train the troops, again, this is racism in the United States, white men and black men. Well, white men weren't gonna train the black men and certainly black men weren't gonna train the white men. So they established a training camp in the state called Iowa, which is west of Harlem. You know, most of these black men hadn't been anywhere past the state of New York. So they go to training. They had to train them quickly. They became infantrymen. They became officers. They became leaders. They became trainers to train their men and to lead their troops. But they never mixed the white stayed to the whites and the blacks stayed to the, the blacks. So as the war was growing, they created two divisions. This was new, this was new. At that time, the United States had three divisions of military. They had the US Army, they had the Navy, and they also had the Marines. But it was only the US Army that took trained infantrymen into these units to make them black soldiers to fight. Discrimination? Yes. The Navy took them and the Marines took them, again, as laborers. They worked as maybe cooks on the ships. They helped unload. They loaded the ships. They dug the trenches. But only the U.S. Army took the Black soldiers and trained them to be military heroes of World War I. As I said, the discrimination existed in the training all the way through. But the Harlem Hellfighters, Coming from Harlem, they were trained infantry unit, ready to fight and ready to be a part of World War I as a soldier. So you gotta think, this is a big deal. These people are heroes. They've never had the opportunity. They're excited. They're excited to be a part of something. They're patriotic. They were fighting and serving the same country that I serve today. They were excited to go, they were adventurous, and they were going to Europe. They were getting out of Harlem and they were going to Europe. So that enthusiasm also came, there they are on the ship. Can you see that? Can you imagine how excited they were? I mean, just the joy and the exhilaration they have of getting on a ship, sailing across the Atlantic Ocean and fighting in World War I. I love this photo to, to dig, I mean, it's just, it embolizes, you know, young men willing to do what it takes to be successful and for their country to win the war as they're going through. You don't see any white men on this ship. Remember that there are no white men. This is all black men on this ship. The Harlem Hellfighters are going to Europe. Well, the Harlem Hellfighters also brought with them a band the Harlem Hellfighters Band. I know, a band. Why would you take a band to Europe? Music is good for morale. And I know a lot of you listen to music and it, it energizes you. Sometimes, you know, you can dance to it, you sing to it, you listen to it in the car. There's all forms of music and music energizes all kinds of people. Well, the Harlem Hellfighters weren't doing music to be sad because they're excited. I mean, they were energized. They're going to fight for their country. And this was a big deal. They had a full uniform. They had coats given to them. A lot of them were coming from poor families and they didn't even have a warm winter coat to begin with. But by golly, the US Army gave them that. So here they are with their band leader. You can tell they're on a ship. You can see the floor on board. They've got their hats, their coats on and they got their instruments. 
So as the war broke out and the Harlem Hellfighters were sailing, there's a bigger picture of the band. Look at that. Can you imagine? So, and you have to think when they were sailing for a lot of them, most of these guys, they don't even know how to swim. And here they are on a ship sailing across the Atlantic Ocean. And I'm sure Emily's grandmother could have told you at the tides, as you see it out here in the Mediterranean, when the wind blows, it gets uh, obnoxious. They were probably getting sick and they were trying to think, are we ever going to get there? But they maintained. I think this photo is kind of funny because they don't look as energetic as they did when they left, but they're hanging in there and they've got their instruments. And I imagine I probably after our days of traveling, someone just made them grab their instruments and pose for this photo. I know. So it's kind of hard, whether this was part of when they were leaving or getting ready to sail into port. I don't know, but it's like, I'm sure it was cold. Oh, I bet it was cold on that ship. And here they are out there. And as a musician, I am a musician. I'm a classical violinist. I play the violin. A big part of your instrument are keeping your fingers warm and keeping them so you can play. And oh, I bet it was freezing and still to be out there and to play their instruments and their trombones and their clarinets and their saxophones and the drummers. I bet it kept them warm and it kept their mind off of the fact that they were freezing cold. So again, here they are excited. Remember prior to anybody else going over, they may have had family members who were there as laborers. And these guys are coming over in uniforms to fight and to be a part of it again. There are no white men in this picture. So remember that to go through. Discrimination still existed. Well, the exciting part about the Harlem Hellfighters, which is fascinating to me, is that they learned the French national anthem, the Marseille. They sailed into the port of Brest. And a lot of townspeople, it was a big deal to go see the sailors. And you have to remember, France was battered at that time. I mean, they've been facing war in that country for three years. They've lost a lot of men, a lot of the young boys. Families were saddened. They may have lost more than one son to war. But as part of just enthusiasm, they would go down to the port and watch these ships that were sailing from America come in and the men were coming off the ships. There was something about it that just gave them the energy needed to know that it's possible we could still win this war despite the tremendous losses. So here come the Harlem Hellfighters. Okay, so despite whatever, how hairy the crossing may have been and how sick they may have been, they got their instruments and they get off the ship playing the French national anthem to jazz, not the stoic, very conservative music sounding like it was. They had jazzed it up. And you have to think, these people in Brest are watching these black men come off a boat happy and playing this jazz music. They weren't familiar with jazz, let alone hearing their national anthem played to a crazy fun tune that was energizing everybody. So everybody that was at the port and watched the Harlem Hellfighters band get off the ship, they just stood there. You can imagine. Everybody's in awe. Their mouths are open. The next thing they all stood up and they started saluting. They started saluting and they got into it. And they thought, this is great. So it brought hope, it brought enthusiasm and it brought fun to the French and the other soldiers that were there when the Harlem Hellfighters Band got off that ship. So enthusiasm, ready to go. You can see them all there. What a mess of people it must have been, but what fun. And it's spring day. It looks like it was a nice day and the weather was good as they were going. So Harlem Hellfighters, they have landed and they're in France and their enthusiasm is still strong. This is a program and I'll get to this in a little bit. I'll segue for a minute before I get back to the, their fighting. The Harlem Hellfighters band was received so incredibly well that the armed forces, the American leaders, General Pershing and others thought, let's get this band to Paris because Paris was war-torn, weary, doing without, starving practically, except for the food that Algeria supplied them. So they did concerts in Paris, the Harlem Hellfighters Band. This is a program from one of their concerts. And so you can see the music that they played. And there it is, the 369th US Infantry Hellfighters Band. 
But do you see across the top where it says, all of no man's land is ours. Remember what I told you about no man's land? You got a trench, you got a trench, and you have all that land in the middle. That's no man's land. They were so enthusiastic about it. They carried this as a theme and to go. The concerts, these jazz concerts, mind you, a lot of people had never heard jazz before and seen the black men playing all these instruments, really pizzazzing it up and hitting the drums and having fun, were sold out. Riots broke out at one concert that they had. They had 50,000 people show up to see this band and a riot broke out. So the enthusiasm was great. I mean, what a wonderful addition the Harlem Hellfighters were to the United States and to the war effort in Europe. And just what they had and the momentum really carried strongly there to going through. So great, fun, Europe loved them, they went on. But sadly, as it was, the Harlem Hellfighters were the, some of the troops that went to the front lines fighting are gone. Some of the worst battles in World War I, the Harlem Hellfighters were there on the front lines. They as units spent more time on the front lines fighting than any other units from the United States Army. That's saying a lot. I mean, that's a lot. So these guys, energetic and excited. Lots of them perished. Lives were perished. And as one of the leaders of the Black unit said, their Black leader told, you know, his comments were, they come from Harlem to the Rhine and they stay. And it's sad. That's it's an outcome of war. It's sad. And so for all the momentum and the excitement, they lost some of their colleagues and some of their friends and to go through it. So it's, it's the downside of war. It's a part of war that we don't like. This is showing a battle and you can see it's pictured here. There's black men, all of it's against the Germans in this battle. The American flag is in the background and it's one of the black military units farting, fighting in the Argonne to go through. So despite the heroic efforts, you can see they're on the front lines, they're still discriminated against and they were the worst treated units of any Europe if any units throughout the European campaigns, the black units were, I don't know why, they were fighting for the same country, they were fighting to win. It's one of the sad things I don't understand about my country, but they were treated horribly while they were there. But they never lost their enthusiasm and they kept playing on. The band played on to go through. I wanna introduce you to one of the Harlem Hellfighter heroes. This is William Henry Johnson. This guy was a hero. In the previous slide, see this slide? See that man fighting? He has no weapon. He only has his hands. He's fighting with his hands. He has no gun, no knife, no nothing. Well, that was William Henry Johnson. He fought a battle against multiple German soldiers, rescuing his fellow Harlem Hellfighters while sustaining injuries himself, all of this is going on. They finally turned the tide and overcame the Germans that were fighting against them. So this guy became a hero, William Henry Johnson. He was one of the Harlem Hellfighters. Mind you, there's not a lot of history about the Harlem Hellfighters. And it was pushed away after World War I. This young man returned back to the United States, a war hero in the black community. Sadly, 10 years later, he died. Nobody knew, he was obscure. He was not known, he wasn't a hero that he came to the, back to the United States with. 10 years later, he died. It's really unfortunate because he did die in obscurity. Almost 70 years later, war efforts and of the black communities in 1996 he was awarded one of the highest medals that the united states army gives it's called the purple heart and the purple heart is for heroism during a battle and action on the field not a very it's very difficult to get because well as you saw in the previous slide he's out there fighting the germans with no weapons and he overturned that and rescued his fellow harlem hellfighters the purple heart 
Mind you, he died in 1929. This is 1996. In 2002, he was awarded the Distinguished Cross. That is a true hero that receives the Distinguished Cross. That was 2002. So mind you, here we are. In 2015, almost 100 years later, after World War I, President Barack Obama awarded him the highest medal you can get, the Medal of Honor. Too bad that smile didn't carry over and he didn't receive those medals when he returned. But you can see the French really recognized the efforts of these Harlem Hell fighters. They were very grateful and recognized it. He has on the French uh, Legion d'Honneur there on his chest, the medal that he does has. So it looks like he's on the ship heading back to the United States. And look at that smile. He knew he did something right for his country, the United States of America. He served and he proudly fought to defend the honor of many. The Harlem Hellfighters at the end of World War I, they returned as heroes to the United States. And they should be, they fought alongside. Now remember, still discrimination. Went back on separate ships, everything was still the same. And they returned. The citizens of New York City had a big parade to honor the soldiers and those coming back from World War I. They didn't invite the Harlem Hellfighters to be in it. So the Harlem Hellfighters organized their own parade lining up through Fifth Avenue into New York all the way into Harlem in their regimental colors. And as they marched through Harlem, and you can tell by this picture, the enthusiasm and the excitement because these were their own. There are mothers here, fathers, brothers, sisters, probably girlfriends, little brothers, little sisters, excited for the Harlem Hellfighters to return. William Johnson, who we saw in the earlier slide, smiling there, he got to ride in a convertible car with a big bouquet of flowers all the way through. Harlem knew that these men were heroes and they were recognized but they were not participating in the overall parade. But I tell you, this picture says a lot. And I think it's a beautiful picture of patriotism, of people of color, black people loving the same country that I do, the United States of America. And as they returned, the Harlem Hellfighters band, they got kind of famous. And so those guys did some concert tours throughout the United States and, um, shared a little bit of the courage and the sacrifice that their fellow soldiers, the Harlem Hellfighters, endured. Upon returning, the Harlem Hellfighters and the band, they entered a society that still faced racism and segregation from their fellow countrymen. The white soldiers that served ignored the black soldiers that served. How, how can people who have eyes and hands and feet and everything is good and the desire to serve the same country that we as American citizens all love, be discriminated against, be judged solely on the color of their skin. Race, religion, discrimination, diversity, adversity. I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer and going forward, but I found this little bit of history while I was living in Paris that I never learned while I was a student in the United States. It was not taught in my history classes. Oh yeah, I learned about World War I, but I didn't learn about the Harlem Hellfighters. And when I found this, I was fascinated and I did some digging. And as I said, there's not a lot of history about it, but I think the Harlem Hellfighters were some of the greatest contributors to the war effort of World War I for the United States of America and for Europe. And I hope that you will take that away and know that despite the discrimination and the segregation, they are still part of the same country that I serve today. And that concludes my program. I'm open for questions. If you have any questions, anything that you'd like to hear, I'm ready. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Rebecca. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen. 
And if anybody on YouTube um, wants to ask Rebecca any questions about the topic she just spoke about, African Americans in World War I, um, or maybe anything about herself, she could take some personal questions too. She said she'd be happy to do that. Um, I have a question that bridges those two things, Rebecca. Um, why is this a topic you're interested in? How did you become interested in the role of African Americans in World War I or World War I history in general? Well, Emily, as you said, it wasn't something I studied as a child. I didn't learn about it. But when I was posted to the United States Embassy in Paris, France, it was the celebration of the entering into World War I and when the United States entered into World War I. And we had done some programs there, recognizing the efforts and the contributions that the Americans did to World War I. But it was what I heard as a musician that there was a black band that got off the boat and marched into France playing the Le Marseille in jazz. I was like, that's incredible. And as I've taught music, I have been a part of it. I've served on national boards throughout the US for music and education, never knew that story. So it intrigued me and I thought I gotta dig a little bit deeper. And as I'm digging, then I learned about the Harlem Hellfighters and the Harlem Hellfighter band. And really that that was the introduction of jazz to Europe. So this group of men from Harlem in New York brought jazz to Europe and exposed it for all those in France that had never had the opportunity to hear it. To hear it. I found it mm -hmm. fascinating. And I am not in the military. I am not even from the East Coast. I don't, I've been to Harlem twice and I loved this story. It was just a part of obscure American history that I felt needed to be shared. And so thank you for letting me share it with you this evening. Thank you for sharing it with us. I mean, I think that's a good point. We learn, as everybody does from every country, there are certain things you learn about your country's history in the textbook. There are certain things we learn about the Great War. Um, and African-American involvement in the Great War is not really one of those things that is written about in the textbook. So I think it's really interesting to hear another perspective. So I'm going to share my screen now because I want to see if I can, um, let me see. No, that's not what I wanted. I'm sure. I found a piece of music that was actually recorded in 2019 so we could hear what sort of music they were listening to at the time. Oh, fantastic. But let me <laughs> see if I can actually find this on my screen. Here it is. Okay. The sound quality is not good. Not unsurprisingly, because this, according to this YouTube clip, this really was recorded in 1919, so this is over 100 years old, this clip, uh, and this is the Hellfighters Band, and as Rebecca mentioned earlier, one of their famous songs was On Patrol in No Man's Land. So we'll see if we can hear a little clip of this. <laughs> What's the time? Nine? All in line. All right, boys, now take it slow. Are you ready? Eddie, very good, Eddie. Over the top, let's go. Quiet, quiet, else is caught a riot. Keep your proper distance, fall along. Hubba, mother, and when you see me hubba, obey my orders and you won't go wrong. There's a million bus a come in, look out. Hear that roar, there's one more, and that, oh, there's a very nice, don't gas for the find you all right, don't start to bumming with those hand grenades, there's a machine gun, the holy space, alert, gas, put on your mask, adjust it correctly, and hurry up fast, drop, there's a rocket for the fight, run, down, on the ground, close your hand, don't stand. That's probably enough of that recording from 1919, <laughs> but I wanted to play that just so our listeners and we could have a sense of the songs that they actually heard this regiment playing when they arrived in France, like they weren't listening to this kind of music at all. And I know that's a very early version of jazz. People probably don't think of what we just heard is jazz today. Um, but it was a new music form at the time and uh, people in France had never heard this before. And then all of a sudden they were introduced to it by this African-American regiment who came from the United States. 
That was a great recording. Thanks. And it's, um, it's a catchy tune. I mean, you know, it's to go through. So thank you for sharing that. Really, that was fabulous. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I thought it was kind of catchy. If anybody wants to look that up on YouTube, you're welcome to share it. Um, so we don't have any questions coming in right now. Someone did make a comment earlier that I wanted to share with you. Uh, a user, Ibti, said that in Algeria, they rarely talk about World War I or World War II because it was like not their, the sense that it wasn't their business uh, and because France forced their grandfathers to participate in it. So it's something we talk a lot about in the US a lot, although probably not as often as we talk about World War II, but in Algeria, at least from this one person watching said that it's not really talked about much here. And you are exactly right. I've given this program once before and that question did come up and I have to agree. Uh, it wasn't as the Algerians readily volunteered to go. I think it was more of a, you are encouraged to help us with this. But again, they brought so much and did so much to save the efforts of American soldiers, you know, just through the food and the assistance in fighting this war. So when I found that little piece, I found it fascinating. And again, um, maybe not under the best of circumstances, but nobody ever wants to voluntarily go into war. And uh, that's just a sad outcome of it. But the contributions of the Algerians was tremendous. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and maybe I'll ask you just one more question about Algeria um, that's not related to World War I. Okay. Uh, I think our viewers might be interested to hear more of your perspective on living here. Perhaps a uh, favorite thing that you've seen or done in Algeria uh, and what is still on your bucket list to see or do before you leave Algeria? Oh, there's still so much I wanna see and do in this country and um, I have to say one of the most beautiful spots I've been outside of the Sahara, you know, the blessing is I got to see the Sahara and sadly, once COVID hit, a lot of my colleagues haven't been down there yet. So we haven't been able to travel. So I don't want to say too much of now how much I loved it. But um, interestingly enough in the Sahara, it was kind of an organized uh, group. And um, during this outdoor dinner we're having in the middle of the desert one night, this jazz band came kind of playing I mean these musicians it was more reggae kind of reggae music and playing but it was so fun I just I thought it was great so musicians again reggae music playing in the desert that was a fun experience one of the most beautiful spots I've seen is up in and I always maybe say this incorrectly in Anaba Anaba and I had been up there and um the gentleman that were with me for the day I had some time towards the end of the day and I said okay show me your favorite spot because the water's right there. It's on the coast. And I said, show me your favorite spot. And they took me up to the old lighthouse. Maybe some of you have been there and are familiar with it. Then there's this old lighthouse. So we had to kind of hike and we had to crawl over some rocks to get up there. And honestly, I got up there and I almost cried and it just still, I can vividly see it. It's one of the most beautiful spots I have ever seen. You see the majestic view of the mountains, and then the water, and there's nothing built on the coastline. That's what I love about your country. It's still so beautifully preserved and the coastline was free. The photos I took of that, it's a screensaver on my computer. I mean, the background of that. And every time I look at it, it's like, oh, I wanna go back. I wanna go back. That was an amazing, amazing spot. And I, I have to say it was incredibly beautiful. And despite the mountains, everything there, it's all great. But that day, looking out over the coastline and seeing that spectacular. And it just, as I try and tell my friends and family and other Americans, your country is beautiful from the water to the mountains to the Sahara. You all have so much to be so proud of because it is just tremendous natural beauty here. You don't need to build anything. You don't need to put it up. I also, I will say, I do like the Roman ruins. I find it fascinating how well preserved they are. And throughout my travels throughout the world, I've seen a lot of Roman ruins. These in Algeria are some of the best. In fact, I was in Lebanon, Baalbek. They have great Roman ruins there. And the man that was my guide that day that was with me, when he, I said something, it's like, well, you know, Algeria has something. He looked at me and he said, you're from Algeria? Do you know the Roman ruins I want to see more than any place in the world are in Algeria? It's my dream to go there. And he was talking about Tim God. So you guys have 
amazing history here. And it's, I'm, I feel really fortunate that I got to be and live in your country. I've been here almost three and a half years. That's longer than most people. And um, I've loved every minute of it. So thank you. Thank you so much for that, Rebecca. Um, I agree, Algeria has, Algerians have so much to be proud of here. Um, and we also, you know, as Americans feel that we have a lot to be proud of, of our country. So that's why we like to do these chats with you and share a part of American culture. So I hope you guys watching enjoyed hearing about um, a rather specific, but very interesting part of US culture. And that is the role that African-Americans played in World War I. Um, we're doing a couple more um, Black History Month talks next Wednesday. We're going to have um, an interesting talk on sort of why we celebrate Black History Month and also some uh, little known historical facts. Um, and in two weeks from now, I believe that's on Wednesday, March 3rd, we're going to have a music special um, about African-American music. It's going to have a live performance. So I'm really excited for that one. So please do follow us on YouTube so you guys don't miss any of these. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook as well if you'd like, but you can hit subscribe on YouTube and you'll see all these talks coming up. So thank you so, so much to my guest, Rebecca Robinson. It was a pleasure. I learned a lot and it was a pleasure to speak with you. And thanks to everyone watching on YouTube. We'll see you again next week. Have a good evening. Night.